Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd Dear and respected brothers and sisters in Islam, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh This is a response to brother Sajid wa faqahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala li kulli khair May Allah azza wa jal guide me and guide him and guide all of us inshallah Because all of us are in constant need for guidance to be guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why we always recite in Surah Al-Fatiha, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for guidance. We say, Ihdina Surata Al-Mustaqeem. Brother Sajid, a few days ago, he released a video in which he made a response to another brother. I believe his name is Brother Riyadh, who's, uh, I think, active on TikTok. I do not know the other brother, and I just, want to, I just wanted to make very clear that in this video, I'm not defending the other brother very simply for the fact that I cannot defend someone that I do not know. When I know of another Muslim, alhamdulillah, by default, we only think good of our other brothers and sisters in Islam. However, when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to someone preaching Islam, I cannot endorse or defend someone when I do not know what their ideology is. However, this video, in this video, I'm making a response to Brother Sajid because Brother Sajid made a video in which he uh, threw some really big accusations at the other brother. And even worse than that, Brother Sajid established a few principles that go very clearly against the foundations of Islam, as we will see in a moment, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One nasiha, first of all, one advice I would like to start with to my brothers and sisters, especially to the youth who are very active on social media and they take much of their deen from the social media, from videos they find on YouTube and TikTok and so on and so forth. First of all, can you take your Islam from a brother like Brother Sajid? The answer is no. You cannot learn your Islam from Brother Sajid. In other words, taking your Islam from Brother Sajid will not be a hujjah for you, will not be a sufficient proof to save you on the Day of Judgment because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to take the, to take Islam, to take our deen, obviously from the Qur'an first, from the Book of Allah, then from our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But then, of course, we need uh, people to help us understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah interpretation, those who are qualified to do so. But that is about the scholars of Islam, the tried and tested, the true ulama of Islam. They are the references, they are the experts in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just like any random person on the internet, someone making da'wah videos on YouTube, they will not serve you as a reference on the day of judgment. In other words, you cannot come to, the, to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yawm al-qiyamah, and Allah azza wa jal says, why? Did you do this or why did you believe in this? And you say, because I saw Brother Sajid or any other brother on YouTube, they told me to do this. Well, this will not save you on the Day of Judgment because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to take the scholars, the ulama, as references, not just any person who talks about Islam. Now, to be clear, I'm not, uh, you know, putting down Brother Sajid. Brother Sajid, barakallahu ta'ala fi wa faqahullah, I watched some of his videos in the past and he made some great videos, mashallah, uh, like his video about Jordan Peterson, some of the videos that he made about the liberal values destroying Muslim families and so on and so forth. That being said, there's a difference and this is a call to all the brothers out there making da'wah over the internet. When you make da'wah over the internet, if you are not qualified, if you don't, you're not an advanced talibul ilm, at least you're not an advanced student of knowledge, then at least what you should be doing is, first of all, things like mawa'id, reminders. What do we mean by reminders? Reminders is when someone is talking to you uh, or is talking about things in Islam that are already known. However, they are only giving you a reminder. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So, Brother Sajid can do great work, mashallah, if he can release videos, you know, uh, telling the youth about the importance of salat, how important to do our salat on time, staying away from things that are clearly harmful and clearly prohibited and haram, forbidden in Islam, like problems like drugs, for example, like wasting time on social media, stuff like that. So um, 
that, that's not complicated, right? That just need an, that just needs an honest, sincere person who knows how to talk to the youth, who knows the mindset of the youth, and so on and so forth. Also, Brother Sajid and other brothers making da'wah online can be making da'wah videos addressing uh, people who are not Muslim. For example, calling them to Islam, to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, responding back to the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like, uh, like he did with Jordan Peterson, and so on and so forth. So you're not risking much as long as you know pretty much uh, most of your foundations of Islam and you have a good da'wah approach, then inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing good things inshallah. Of course, before all, we need to uh, we need to uh, clean our intentions and make, make sure that our actions are sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when brothers like Sajid and other brothers, they start talking about things that they have not much knowledge about and things that have big consequences and even things that are considered to be controversial even within the ummah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when i say controversial it doesn't mean that there's no answer to them it doesn't mean that the that the deen itself is controversial about them no it just means that because of like we will say today inshallah for example like we will see in a moment because sometimes of political pressures and political discord and everything even some matters of the deen of islam they will become controversial on the public scene it's not because of islam itself if you go and study islam from its uh from its um valid references and from its authentic references it will be very clear to you what the truth is but sometimes it's the reality it's the context the political context the social context that makes some matters in some times like in our era become very controversial so when brother sajid and other brothers who are not qualified they just get involved in those areas and they start you know putting out their conclusions and talking to the youth and saying this is right and this is wrong and throwing labels because he was throwing labels at the other brother who's telling that he is from the khawarij so that's 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 a big thing right when you say that someone is from the khawarij because prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us about how evil the khawarij are iyadan billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala so and of course brother sajid as we will see in a moment inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala unfortunately in that video that he made in his response to that other brother uh, he made some pretty much disastrous uh, statements so or at least those statements can have disastrous effects on the aqidah on the understanding that many of the youth and many of the viewers will have about islam and about the foundations of islam so we have to be very careful brothers in islam uh, if you have a a, a a presence online allah Azza wa Jal has blessed you uh you know uh people they follow you or you are good at getting followers and so and so on and so forth you still have to fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we all have to fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we still have to think about the consequences of our actions the consequences of our words because prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as it came in the hadith of Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu he told us that he told us that the, the number one reason why people will be thrown in jahannam hellfire on their faces is their tongue hasaid al sinatihim and scholars like imam ibn rajab alayhi rahmatullahi ta'ala they explain that why tongue throws so many people in jahannam is not just because of lying and because of backbiting there's even more evil things than that and he mentions for example shirk billah many people will commit shirk polytheism just with their state Statements. And he also mentions something which in the Quran comes very close to the danger and the threat and the and basically uh, the consequences of ashirk billah azza wa jal, which is talking about Allah and about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge. So going out there and telling people this is what Islam is, this is halal, this is haram, this is good, this is bad and you have no knowledge, you're not really qualified, you didn't really check your information before spreading it. Let's remember here, like Brother Sajid was talking about matters, as we will see inshallah in this video, Brother Sajid was talking about matters related to the foundations of Islam, about Tawheed, the meaning of Tawheed. Can you imagine that Allah sent down the prophets and the messengers? The reason why Allah sent prophets and messengers, basically this big, huge thing. The reason why Allah Azza wa Jal created Jahannam and Jannah, paradise and hellfire is all about the ibadah, the act of ibadah, the concept of ibadah and all about Tawheed. This was the main reason. So when someone comes on the internet 
on YouTube and just makes a video without really verifying what they are saying. This brother Sajid did not provide much references. He was just saying, this is how it is basically because I'm telling you so. That's why my video will be a long video. People do not like video, do, do not like long videos. Well, if you don't have the patience to learn the foundations of your Islam, that's not my problem. That's not my problem. I'm not here to follow the culture of YouTube and to submit to the culture of the social media. I'm just doing my duty, which is, you know, putting things back in perspective and telling people what the true foundations of this deen are. And to do it, I have to give you references. I cannot just come on the internet and say, you know, this is how it is and Brother said it is wrong because I said so. No, we're not here to do drama and responding back to others. I'm here to provide you with sound references as I will present to you, inshallah ta'ala, very clear evidence. And even with this video that some people will find that it's a long video, this is just a sample. If I had really to go into the details and bring you um, most of the references that I can have access to <clears throat> this video basically this will turn into a series and not just one video so even what I will present you today will be just samples basically the next point again I just want to, to make very sure I'm not here to defend the other brother or to endorse him of course I endorse him as my brother in Islam I defend him as my brother in Islam we are all brothers we are all one ummah when it comes now to the details of what people believe in what they preach uh, as long as I don't have the time to go spend and you know review all of these brothers uh, videos on TikTok and stuff like that I cannot come out and say the other brother was right and Sajid was wrong so this is not Sajid versus that brother Riyad from TikTok this is just about Sajid what he said this was his video he's responsible for what he said he had the whole freedom to say whatever he wants nobody was just like taking segments of the words of Sajid I just took the video of Sajid watch it from beginning to the end to get a comprehensive idea of what Sajid really is promoting which is clearly false and as we said it can have desire consequences on our aqidah on the understanding of what tawheed and what ibadah is and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us now brother Sajid he accuses the other brother as being from Hizb tahrir he says the other brother is from Hizb tahrir is he from Hizb tahrir is he not from Hizb tahrir I have no idea okay I have no idea as long as I don't have the proof that the other brother is from Hizb tahrir or he uh, says himself he is from Hizb tahrir I cannot basically um, I cannot say that the other brother is from Hizb tahrir however the uh, already one let's say small problematic thing that brother Sajid presented which will not be the center of my video really uh, there's always a five percent chance that I'm wrong on this but if brother Sajid can prove me wrong please go ahead Akhi, and provide your references but he says that Hizb tahrir are from the Khawarij we'll talk in a moment about the Khawarij are they really from the Khawarij now if we take this book here this is called al Mawsu'atu al Muyassara this book was authored by a group of top scholars and researchers on Aqidah. It was published by Wami a few decades ago. So Wami is an official or used to be an official uh, entity, Islamic entity of the Saudi government. So um, Brother Sajid should respect this as a reference because I forgot also to say that you know from my understanding this this is a topic for another day as they say I cannot I cannot go into the details but it's just important that we uh, briefly summarize a few points about this inshallah azawajal. everyone in this life has a manhaj has a, an ideology they have their references their mindset and so on and so forth their main principles it is pretty it was from before it was pretty obvious to me that Brother Sajid uh, is basically uh, a neo-Salafi or as we call them the quietest Salafis okay so apolitical Salafis so Brother Sajid he's one of those brothers that seem again Brother Sajid if you're not if if that's not you, please, please, please make it clear, okay? You, you can respond back to me again. There's always, I would say, 1% chance that I'm wrong on this. But from what I got from the uh, from the previous videos of Brother Sajid, Brother Sajid is someone that you would call Salafi, but this is the new generation of Salafis, the neo-Salafis. These are the Salafis that follow basically the official deen and the official manhaj being promoted by the current Saudi 
regime. So I'm saying neo Salafis because I'm not talking here about Salafiya, which is the the original traditional Salafiya, which is following the Salaf. Every every Muslim should be following the Salaf, meaning the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, the companions. That's just you know one of the foundations of Islam. However, I'm talking about Salafiya here as a modern movement, as a movement, as a uh, as I would not say a group. Let's just call it a movement here. Brother Sajid is part of that apolitical Salafiya, meaning. You don't hear him talk much about politics. He doesn't really believe politics are that important in Islam. Whatever happens in the Muslim world, you know, it's not really important. So Brother Sajid, um, you know, is one of the, those brothers that would talk mostly about some matters of Aqidah. I'm saying some matters and all of the matters. You will see why in a moment, inshallah. Brother Sajid and other brothers from his, from his manhaj and the same mindset and the same ideology uh, we talk about Sunnah, for example, uh, versus Bid'ah, the dangers of Bid'ah and the importance of Sunnah. Sometimes they will talk about the dangers of some forms of Shirk, but not all the forms of Shirk, as we will see very obviously today in this video, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I thought Brother Sajid was more on the milder side. So the milder side is those, again, apolitical, quietist Salafis, neo-Salafis that just avoid politics altogether. Now you have a heavier, the heavyweight neo-Salafis that we call the hardcore madkhalis, iyadan billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people are clear deviants. They stand up for the current... Uh, Arab rulers and regimes and they defend them and they justify almost everything they do, right? Even if it goes very clearly against Islam, even if when those people, they become enemies of Islam, they still defend them and they put them forward and they promote them as being the excellent people, the best people that we should be uh, obeying and we should be following and we should be praising and so on and so forth. And even to the extent that they will, these madkhalis or uh, hardcore neo-Salafis, they will, they will take their own brothers in Islam as enemies. You know, they, they consider them to be worse enemies than even the kuffar, iyadun billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they have very clear statements on it. Now, I thought, you know, Brother Sajid was more on the milder side. When we say milder side, meaning the type of brothers that would just, he just doesn't want to talk about politics. He thinks it's just too complicated. It can get him in trouble. He can get it wrong. But now, Brother Sajid, in the previous video, unfortunately, he's moving kind of, you know, middleweight here, Madkhali. Not like milder anymore. So, brother, you have to be very careful what your manhaj, what your aqidah, what your values are, especially when you did not really study, when you did not really verify, it, as it is very obvious from your previous video. So, now, how Brother Sajid he starts it? Um, there's this not correct way, brother, akhifillahi azza wa jal. And this is again, this is just a reminder. See, my goal is that we are all reminded about the truth and we go back to the truth. So Brother Sajid is my brother in Allah Azza wa Jal. I value a lot of um, the efforts that he that he presents to the youth on YouTube. The reason why I'm being a bit harsh in this video is not because he's my enemy or I want to hurt his image. That's not the reason. I'm being a bit harsh in this video because the matter we are talking about is very serious because as we said the errors the mistakes he made in his previous video are pretty serious are pretty dangerous from an aqidah perspective i'm not meaning here physical danger outside in the street let me be clear i'm just saying they are dangerous for the aqidah for the belief of the muslims that's why we have to be a bit harsh you know to make it very clear here that this is no joke so as i said before Brother Sajid, he starts by saying that Hizb tahrir they are from Al-Khawarij. And we have this book here. This is Al-Mawsu'atul Muyassara. This was an official, uh, this was a book officially published by an entity that is part of the Saudi government, as we said before, Wami. So this was officially endorsed and used to be distributed. Back in the days, the Saudi government used to distribute this book for free, even in the West, send it to Masajid and so on and so forth. Now, it's not because of the Saudi government. It's because, yes, this, this book actually was the effort and the fruit, mashallah, of the work of some of the top scholars of Aqidah at that time. And there was among them Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Abdul Latif, and so on and so forth. 
And this is the fourth edition that I have here. This book talks about the different groups and sects and parties and methodologies, ideologies that exist, first of all, in the first in the in the Muslim world, but then also they have a second volume, which is just about you know comparative religions in general, different religions that exist that exist today in, around the world. This here is the fourth edition. So the fourth edition, they revised a lot of information three times before it, just to make sure you know. So they, they went into extensive research. So before they made their own statements about groups like Hizb tahrir they actually had to read all the books of Hizb tahrir to know about the biographies, the news related to them. They even met some of the people who are leaders in Hizb tahrir and other groups as well. Okay. So they did have a few points against Hizb tahrir they mentioned some things in which Hizb tahrir is wrong, or at least the founders of Hizb tahrir not everyone Hizb tahrir but at least, you know, the founders, what we call Al-Adabiyyat, those who founded Hizb tahrir they have authored their own books, their own references, and they got Islam wrong on a few things. But none of it was related to Khawarij, and they did not classify them as a group to Khawarij, and they did not mention any point of Aqidah in which Hizb tahrir was basically equivalent or agreed with the Khawarij. So why, where did you get that, um, that basically, uh, that conclusion from Akhi Sajid? Allahu A'lam. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ فَعْدِلُوا وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ As in the other ayah, we have to be fair, even with those who we disagree with, even with our enemies in Islam. I cannot um, label someone and I cannot throw accusations on someone without really verifying. For example, I cannot... Um, I cannot say that the Yahud, for example, I cannot say the Yahud that they say that Isa, he is the son of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then someone says, Akhi, it's not true. I say, well, no, they're all deviants, all kafir. No, it's not true. They, the, 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 the Yahud don't believe that Isa, he is the son of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta'ala Allahu an dhalik. So we have to be fair. Okay, even if you disagree with the group, if they are from the Khawarij, please bring the evidence. Where did you get this from? Who said this before you? Bring me a scholar of Aqidah and of comparative sects and religions, Dirasatul Firaq, not yourself, Sajid, because you're not a reference in the deen. So you cannot, by yourself, just label a whole group of Muslim. We've got thousands of Muslims around the world who are part of Hizb tahrir It's not just, you know, the right of Brother Sajid to come and say they are Khawarij. Why? Because I said so. Well, you're not a scholar on this matter, so you're not a reference. So if you have any references, please let me know. And I will um, I will basically accept that you are right on that. But now let's move to the bigger things. As we said, Brother Sajid starts with this statement that he uh, repeats twice in his video. One, once in the beginning, once at the end of the video. And that's a dangerous way of doing da'wah and debating with your brothers. So he says, this ideology, so he is saying, the other brother, he's from Hizb tahrir they are from Khawarij, and this ideology that they are promoting, that this brother was promoting, leads to bloodshed, death, and destruction of Muslim society. So you're kind of bringing the boogeyman in the room here. You're scaring everyone, right? So when you say that someone, his ideology is about, first word here, bloodshed already, that's red. You're kind of destroying the other person. For, for a lot of viewers, they will agree with you right away. Oh, you're, you're warning us about someone who is causing bloodshed. A'udhu billah. He's causing death, destruction of Muslim society. Akhi, this is... This is a bit too much. This is a bit too much. That's not, you know, that's not fair. That's not how you defend your ideas or your opinions or your beliefs. Yes, the Khawarij, the Khawarij, historically, the, the real Khawarij that we all agree they were Khawarij, yes, they caused a lot of destruction, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of death, even in the time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. But now you're just pointing to a brother you disagree with and right away you link him to bloodshed and death and destruction. And then you add to it khawarij. What do you want exactly, Akhi? What do you want? You know what these kind of accusations they can lead to, right? You, you know how how it can even affect this brother in his personal life. You know how, how any Muslim can get in trouble for being linked 
to any of these words nowadays, right? So you're kind of reminding me of like CNN or Fox News like 10 years ago or something when uh, the, the moment they talk about Islam, they talk about the, the mosque, the masjid or something. It's the same keywords, bloodshed, destruction of the world and destruction of liberty and societies. Then of course, everybody's going to be afraid of Islam and the Muslims. You're kind of doing the same thing, Akhil Habib. So the brother was not talking about bloodshed. He's talking about... Uh, ideology so imagine i will give you an example imagine if someone starts defending you're an american if someone starts defending the ideals of the american revolution in front of you brother sajid so someone starts praising you know the ideals of the american revolution he says we should stand up for those principles for those values and ideals and you'll say what you're calling to bloodshed you're promoting bloodshed and death and destruction because in your mind historically the american revolution was about bloodshed and death and destruction or the french revolution for example no this person is talking about the ideals they're not they're not saying let's do another revolution let's do bloodshed and destruction again necessarily so we have to be fair and in your video as i said the problem is you're actually laying down the foundations of secularism as i said you know that's why he this whole neo salafism that starts as in as an apolitical salafism ends up becoming a secular salafia secular islam secular version of islam you're you're actually giving them you know the tools you're giving the seculars the tool to make islam become a secular religion why because people like brother sajid they said so so let's start now with the actual content where were the big mistakes that brother sajid he made in that video first of all he says for example i'm just picking here a few statements okay because you kind of repeated Brother Sajid kind of repeated the same uh, the same thing in various ways. But I'm just picking a few statements that were very clear on what he meant. He says they made, they made, meaning these people who are wrong, they made the foundations of their religion about politics and legislation. So he believes that it is wrong if someone makes the foundations of their religion about politics and legislation. Basically, Brother Sajid, what he was doing in his video is that he dissociates the concept of hukm from the concept of ibadah and the kalima of tawheed, la ilaha illallah. Now, we've got a few key words here, Arabic key words. Mustalahat shar'iyah, part of Islam. These key words are part of Islam, part of our deen. Let me point to a problem we already have here, and I noticed it in the this whole you know discussion or debate or uh, disagreement between the two brothers. We have a problem already with the tr with translation. We cannot rely on translation in these type of matters, word to word translation. Meaning, for example, they you know they were debating whether uh, ibadah means worship or sovereignty. I don't think that's the correct way of of dealing with these matters. Why? Because English is a different language than Arabic. And you will very hardly and very rarely find words in English that 100% fit the meaning of the other word in Arabic. And that applies to most languages. Translation is never, uh, is never precise. And that's why we always get lost in the translation. And we always lose some details, some meaning the moment we start translating now this becomes more serious because these words are the key words of the foundations of islam these are the key words this is not like something you know uh this is not something that just touches uh, a, a portion some part of islam no ibadah hukm kalima tawheed la ilaha illallah tawheed these are the foundations these are at the very core of islam so if someone gets the translation wrong or if some details of the meaning get lost in the translation then we've got a serious problem when it comes to the consequences the implications what we will get from this now what is the solution i believe the solution is for these type of concepts, you don't translate them, you explain them. Meaning, one word, ibadah, what is ibadah? Well, ibadah, you can expand on it. You can talk about it in a few statements to explain in details what ibadah implies in Islam. What is part of ibadah in Islam? So, the brother talks about the concept of hukm. Hukm, which includes hukm. So, we say hukm, hakim, hakama. The concept of hukm, and I will mention to you a few ayat and a few references, so don't be in a hurry. The concept of hukm includes 
politics and legislation includes political matters as well as legislation in islam brother sajid he dissociates hukum from worship and from the kalima of tawhid he make it seem as if in islam um ibadah let's call it ibadah not worship because again i'm doing the translation here and you will not be happy so let's call it ibadah he thinks that ibadah in islam is just about the way we invoke we should not be invoking graveyard the basically dead bodies in the graves we should not be invoking uh spirits and the jinn and stuff like that and uh, stones and rocks and idols we only invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We only pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We only do the, you know, sacrifice of animals for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how a lot of these new Salafis, they think. They think that's just what ibadah is about. In reality, ibadah also includes hukm, which is legislation and political matters that we will cover bi idnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the very famous ayah in surah al-Ma'idah Allah azza wa jal he says at the end of the ayah wa man lam yahkum bima anzala Allah fa ulaika humul kafirun this uh, this portion of the ayah that I have just recited you know it triggers many of these madkhalis and I'm not talking about brother Sajid but brother Sajid maybe some of the people you took your deen from they are like this a lot of them they get triggered just the moment you mention this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but if you say وَمَن لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ from Surah Al-Ma'idah they will start jumping right away you khawarij you're khawarij you're talking you're repeating the evidence of the khawarij the words of the khawarij كَلِمَةُ حَقٍ أُرِيدَ بِهَا بَاطِلٍ right so it's like they are they kind of allergic to some of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ that's just what nifaq is all about subhanallah when you're sensitive to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know some of the Quran you're kind of uncomfortable with just to please your governors and your rulers and the political basically people out there that's that's a serious matter that's a serious matter and even some of these madkhalis and neo-salafis apolitical some of them you know some of their mashayikh and their their references and so on and so forth they consider them to be scholars unfortunately the, even when they quote this ayah, you know, in a lot of times, they kind of, you know, start with disclaimers before quoting this ayah to its end. So they start right away telling, Kufrun, do not kufran, be careful, don't understand, like the khawarij. They have to add, Ya akhi, it's the, it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, recite it as it is. Why do you have to add all, all of these commentaries uh, around it, you know, as if, you know, the word of Allah azza wa is not clear. The problem is, in these people's minds, their deen is not clear. That's the problem. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَرَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Those that don't do the hukm by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. We have the revelation from Allah. If you don't do hukm by the revelation, Allah azza wa jalla says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ Those are the kafiruna. So we have different types of ayat in the Quran. In some ayat like this one, the ones that don't do hukm by the revelation of Allah, they are kafirun. In some ayat, Allah azza wa jalla mentions that those who don't do the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't submit to the hukm of Allah, they are not mu'mineen. In other ayat we will mention in a moment, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal mentions that uh, those who don't do the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or they follow other hukm than the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are mushrikeen, polytheists. The Quran is very clear on this, akhi al-habib. This is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the reality as we said, unlike Brother Sajid, Hafizahullah, was uh, trying to present, the reality is that in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the concept of tawheed, the oneness of Allah azza wa jal, monotheism, includes the principles of hukm and legislation. It includes them. So hukm and legislation, they are part of the concept of tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not the only ones. Yes, there are groups, modern groups, that when they talk about Tawheed, it's the other opposite of these Madkhalis. When they talk about Tawheed, they only talk about legislation and, and, and politics. And they ignore other very serious matters of Tawheed, like Tawheed al-Ibadah, uh, so Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, basically making, you know, as we said before, that our dua should be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our intention should be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this is part of Tawheed, and we have different components components of the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, 
أفحكم الجاهلية يبغون ومن أحسن من الله حكما لقوم يوقنون This is ayah 50 in chapter 5 سورة المائدة Allah Azza wa Jal says Do they want the hukm? The hukm, remember, hukm is legislation Includes legislation and includes political matters This is what hukm is about Because I will quote you the scholar on it The, the, the scholars of tafsir on it, inshallah Allah Azza wa Jal says Do these people want the hukm of jahiliya? Do they want to apply the hukm of jahiliya? What is jahiliya? Jahiliya is pre-Islam It is kufr We know we have before the coming of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The time right before we call it the times of jahiliya. So jahiliya is al-kufr Times of kufr Times of darkness Iyadan billah Allah Azza wa Jal says Do they want the hukm of Jahiliya, when in reality, what is better than the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What did Imam Ibn Kathir? So, already here we have kind of it's clear, you know, Quran is always clear. We have already it's either the hukm of kufr or hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you don't want to take my word for it, listen to Imam Ibn Kathir in his tafsir. What does he say in this, in this, uh, about this ayah? Yunkiru ta'ala ala man kharaj an hukm illahi al muhkami. المشتمل على كل خير الناهي عن كل شر الله عز وجل is blaming those people that left the hukm of Allah سبحانه وتعالى which includes every good and you know warns against every evil that's, that's the hukm of Allah that's the sharia of Allah sharia of Allah عز وجل the hukm of Allah legislation the rulings of Allah سبحانه وتعالى they are here to tell us about every good can be found in the shara of Allah Azza wa and to warn us against every evil, stay away from it. Some people they try, they prefer to let to leave that hukm of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Why? Because instead of it, وَعَدَلَ إِلَى مَا سِوَاهُ مِنَ الْآرَاءِ وَالْأَهْوَاءِ وَالْإِصْطِلَاحَاتِ الَّتِي وَضَعَهَا الرِّجَالُ بِلَا مُسْنَدٍ مِنْ شَرِيعَةِ اللَّهِ. He says. Those people, they left the hukm of Allah and instead they went for the hukm, the rulings that were made up by people. الرجال وضعها المستن الرجال بلا مستند with no basis they have no reference in the شرع of Allah سبحانه وتعالى what was their reference he says الآراء their own opinions and أهواء their own passions that's what that's what you know man made laws are based about so nowadays you have in uh, Muslim societies being ruled by these governments and these uh, regimes like in the Arab countries for for example they have the parliament and then they meet and they start you know they start their parliament session with with uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, Bismillah rahman rahim and then that's it. They forget the Quran after, and then they start debating what should be haram, what should be haram. They make, they they get to decide what is good, what is bad for society, and they ignore the hukm of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It says, كما كان أهل الجاهلية يحكمون به من الضلالات والجهالات. He says, like it was the case for the people of Jahiliya before the coming of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Same thing, you know, those people Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, and they used to meet up and say what should be good, what should be. They make their own system, they make their own rules. Now Allah Azza wa Jal sent them Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم with the ideal, the most perfect system, and they turned away. The munafiqin, they turned away from it. And they want the hukm of al-jahiliya. Now if you think this ayah is only talk about, talking about Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl. Because many of these like new Salafis, you know, they just, they, they, they don't look beyond the words. They think, oh, it's talking about jahiliya. This is about the people, you know, uh, that were doing shirk before the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Then listen to this. Imam Ibn, uh, Imam Ibn Kathir here, he continues on. He, he goes on with the tafsir. He says, وَكَمَا يَحْكُمُ بِهِ التَّتَارُ مِنَ السِّيَاسَاتِ الْمَلَاكِ he says, and it is also, he gives as another example, he says, as it is the case with the Tatar. Now, Tatar, the Mongols that came and invaded the Muslim lands and, and stuff like that. So this was centuries after the time of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So now Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he knows about this. And it used to be a big topic in their time, right? So he says, like what the Tatar, they did. What did the Tatar they do? They, uh, they established... Or they went for a siyasat, rules, political rules, political systems, malakiyah, taken from their kings. So instead of taking the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Tatar, some of them, they pretended to be Muslim. But what did they do? They imposed on the Muslims their own system, their own books, their own rules and laws and so on and so forth. 
al an malikihim Jinkis Khan that they took from their king Jinkis Khan. So Jinkis Khan, very known uh, person in the history of Islam and the history of the world. When I say history of the Islam, doesn't mean that he was a Muslim, but you know he caused so much damage. Iyad Billahi Subhanahu Wa Taala. History of the world, very known here in history. What did he do this this evil man Jinkis Khan الذي وضع لهم اليساق وهو عبارة عن كتاب مجموع من أحكام قد اقتبسها عن شرائع شتى من اليهودية والنصرانية والملة الإسلامية Jinkis Khan he made his own book his own book of law his own laws for his country for the lands he controlled that he had control over he called it اليساق or اليسق and this book was a compilation he compiled this book from different religions and different systems so he took portions of uh judaism al yahudiyya and portion of christianity and he took also laws from the sharia of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from islam he mixed them together he added some of his opinions okay and he said this is the new law that all the muslims should be following now is the, is it okay to do that well, you will say, a lot of you people will say, obviously not, because how can you mix Islam with Yahudiya and Nasraniya? three different religions. Well, guess what? Yahudiya and Nasraniya, even if it's Batil, at least, you know, it's basically their origins are books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that were altered. So it's still like something traditional. I'm not saying you can do it. You will see in a moment you really can't do it. It's kufr. We cannot follow, you know, another deen except the deen of Islam and the risala of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What I'm trying to say here is that even if someone goes and mixes the Quran with the Bible, for example, ahkam of the Bible, this is kufr akbar, major kufr. We all agree on this. Even though the Bible, lots of what is in the Bible still is, you know, uh, it's, it's still rest, the, basically the, the remainings. Much of it is remainings of the message of Isa alayhi salam or Musa alayhi salam. Not everything in the Bible is, is false. But Allah Azza wa told us nowadays to follow nothing but the Quran. Because the Quran is 100% preserved. And because Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi he came for our era. Prophet Isa alayhi salam did not come for us. Prophet Musa alayhi salam did not come for us. Now imagine if that's kufr. What about people who are secular enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they make laws not from the altered Taurat or the altered uh, basically al Injil and remainings of the religion of Musa and Isa alayhim as -salam. they make laws from their own passions, from their own opinions billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala and some people they think you know this is nothing this is not problematic at all well listen to this, he says فصارت في بنيه شرعا متبعا يقدمونها على الحكم بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم he says, once Jinkis Khan, he made that book, al yasiq it became an established law. Even in the his sons that came after him, those who ruled after him, they said, our father, our grandfather, Jinkis Khan, he made this amazing book of law. This is the law that we should be adopting. يقدمونها, and they gave it priority over the Quran and over the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what did Imam Ibn Kathir say about these people? Brother Sajid, please listen. Wallahi inni laka nasihun ameen. I just want to give you an advice. I'm being a bit harsh here, direct, straightforward, because I want you to understand how serious the consequences are of what you were saying. He says, وَمَنْ فَعَلَ ذَلِكَ مِنْهُمْ فَهُوَ كَافِرٌ يَجِبُ قِتَالُهُ He says, and whoever from them, those people from the Tatar, whoever did this, is a kafir. Why is he a kafir? Because he took the man-made laws and he put them prior, before the law, the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a kafir and he says, يَجِبُ قِتَالُهُ He needs to be fought, he needs to be removed by force, by war. Now you understand why you don't hear these type of things very often, brothers and sisters in Islam, because obviously this can get you in trouble, right? For reading texts like this and translating this. And, you know, nobody wants to talk about this nowadays. That's why you have a lot of du'at online and all these like influencers and stuff like that. They just want to talk to you about, you know, how, how to smile in Islam and how to have the most beautiful smile and how to have, how to say good morning and how to say assalamu alaikum. And it's better if you say wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah and even right yes of course that's part of islam but we cannot ignore the other portions which are at the very core the very center of islam so he says 
يجب قتاله he needs to be fought حتى يرجع إلى كتاب إلى حكم الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلا يحكم سواه في قليل ولا كثير until 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 when like if you know if it was Genghis Khan or his one of his what is Imam Ibn Kathir saying here that Genghis Khan and his his uh, the kings after him they need to be fought either they are completely removed or if they come back to the truth which is they come back to the hukm hukm he says hukm of Allah and his rasul his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam fala yuhakkim and he does not use the hukm refer to the hukm of anything else he says fi qalil wala kathir not even in a bit you know if someone says we apply quran and sunnah except in 5% of our life let's just put quran and sunnah uh, you know, on the side, because in some matters we might have better ideas, better options. That's kafirun, kafir. That's what the scholars they said, and before, of course, that's what the Quran says. Also, let's uh, listen to this ayah, two hundred fifty-six from the second chapter, Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions here the concept of at-taghut. Brother Sajid and other brothers, this concept will help you. Understand also what really Tawheed is about. Allah Azza wa Jal says, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لم في لها والله سميع عليم. Allah Azza wa Jal says that if you want to hold on to العروة الوثقى, the scholars they say العروة الوثقى means the 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 main foundation of Islam, right? It's Islam, it's Tawheed, it's the kalima of La ilaha illallah. So if you want to make sure you have it, you grab on it really like very, with a lot of strength. You know what you're doing. He says, Subhanahu wa Taala, you need two things: man yakfur bi-taghut wa yu'min billah. The one you need to do kufr bi-taghut. What is kufr bi-taghut? So in Islam here, there's like this very special thing like a special area here where actually as muslims we are required to do kufr to reject not kufr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course no kufr of the opposite which is kufr of taghut taghut one of the meanings of taghut is the false idols for example that's part of taghut but i will see you will see in a moment inshallah that there's other forms here so false gods things that are becoming that are taken as partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we reject them, we do kufr in them. You say, Ana kafirun I am kafir in this because this is batil, I don't accept it. Number two, you need to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have your two components. That's why, and these two components, they are equivalent to kalimat tawheed, la ilaha illallah. Because what is la ilaha illallah? La ilaha, so it starts with negation. There is no true God, none worthy of ibadah, worship, illallah, except Allah. So yes, I worship Allah, and I worship Allah alone. That's why the scholars, they say, before affirmation, I worship Allah, there was negation. I don't worship the false idols, and the false gods, and the false partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the ulama, they call it takhliya, you clean the heart of any shirk, any form of shirk, including shirk of the governors and shirk of legislation. That's a form of shirk. I will give you the evidence, Akhi, inshallah. We clean the heart, we remove all of that from the heart, and then we put what? The tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I believe in Allah and I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone so half of the tawheed is to reject the taghut and also in the other ayah if you want more evidence that this is about the foundation of the deen foundation of the deen again let's just make let's just um as as we say let's just you know summarize again what we're trying to say here so recap it so we're saying foundations of the deen the very foundation because brother he said foundation of the deen should not have uh legislation and and politics so okay foundations of the deen i'm proving to you that they are about rejecting taghut before all and i will prove to you in a moment inshallah azawajal, that taghut has a lot to do with politics and legislation so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah 
36 in uh, sorry sorry in ayah 36 of surah an-nahl Allah Azza wa Jalla says وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Allah Azza wa Jalla says we have sent in every nation a messenger with this message with this call what was the call of the messengers so the messengers they called to a lot of things to justice to uh, pleasing your parents to giving charity sadaqah and helping and so on and so forth however what was the main message the main call of the messengers of the rusul alayhim salatu wassalam before everything else it was worship allah or make ibadah of allah and ya'budullah wajtanibu at-taghut and reject stay away from taghut now since we brought the word taghut here here's a small book this is a small book here of it's called Risala to Tahkim al Qawanin. Very important. Anyone who understands Arabic, please go look for this book and read it. It will take you, you can find it easily online. It will take you like an hour and a half to read it. Okay? Extremely important. Why is it important? Because, first of all, it's talking about Tahkim al Qawanin, following the hukm, the ruling, referring to the Qawanin. Qawanin are man made laws. And this is a book which was written in our era so it's talking about the systems we have nowadays that they have established in the arab countries now so the topic itself is very relevant it's very fresh very important it has answers for what we are talking about but also the importance comes from the author of the book himself so the author of the book is sheikh muhammad ibn ibrahim who is sheikh muhammad ibn ibrahim he died in 1969 okay and he was the one official mufti of saudi arabia until 1969 a few decades ago so for brothers like brother sajid if you're scared if you're worried that i'm bringing you khawarij here unless you believe you know that the mufti of saudi arabia was from the khawarij that's something else number two sheikh muhammad ibn ibrahim rahimahullah he is the teacher of sheikh Abdullah uh, of Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz. So whenever you say Sheikh Ibn Baz said, you know, this is fatwa from Sheikh Ibn, Ibn Baz, all the Salafi brothers, especially the younger ones, are, oh, Sheikh Ibn Baz, he said so, it must be the truth, okay? This is his Sheikh. So this is the teacher of Sheikh Ibn Baz, alayhi wa rahmatullah. This is Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Ibrahim. So if you think this man is from the Khawarij, we've got a serious problem. What did he say here? And I'm just giving you a few examples here. If, it, really, if you read the book itself, like you will have very clear answers. There's no doubt about it. So the book, the whole book, so is about uh, ruling, about hukm and about legislation. So he says, So he, he explains the word taghut here. And he, he talks about the linguistics. I'm not going to translate this. Not important for, for this uh, video. So he says, whoever, whoever rules and makes hukm, meaning legislation, by other than the hukm of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he has made hukm of a taghut Allah is telling us to reject the taghut and someone he is making tahakum ila taghut or hukm bi taghut He is legislation, legislating by the taghut ruling by the legislation of a taghut iyadan billah subhanahu wa ta'ala now if you have any doubt if you think i'm again this should be clear enough you know i'm just trying to be as clear as possible but we never know some brothers always they say but maybe that's not what he meant so if if you think he's not talking about legislation he's not talking about he's talking about something else okay so he says in the book also, he says, that's how he opens actually the book. That's how the book starts. Inna min al-kufri al-akbari al-mustabeen tanzeel al-qanun illa'een manzilata ma nazala bihi al-ruhu al-ameen ala qalbi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, it is from the clear, he says, mustabeen, clear, major kufr, kufr akbar, tanzeelat, to put the qanun al to put the man-made laws, to put them as equivalent, as if they are 
you know, they can compete with the hukm that Allah has revealed on his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the legislation. So it's very clear. It cannot get more clear than this. That this is about legislation. Qanun is talking about the man-made laws. This is about politics and it's about legislation. He's not talking about dua. Of course, the, the ulama of Aqidah, they talk about tawheed in dua and so on and so forth. And I will quote to you a few scholars at the end, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one might say, then who are the khawarij then? So the khawarij, of course, they are, uh, they, they are the ones who basically unjustly declare Muslimin as being kuffar. They say that Muslim, he's not Muslim anymore, he's a kafir. And yes, Khawarij, they use some of the same evidence that they have misunderstood or misquoted. Now, what is the what is the difference between what we are presenting and between the and between the aqidah of the Khawarij, ideology of the Khawarij? There's a big difference. Khawarij are those who are who, those who make takfir of another Muslim just for sinning, for committing a sin. What do we mean by committing a sin? means not fulfilling some of the legislation, some of the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in practice, in your personal life, in your everyday life. You did not leave the legislation. You did not rebel against the legislation. So let me give you an example here. If, you know, if there's a Muslim, he owns a bar and sells alcohol. You go to him, and you say, Akhi, ittaqillah. You, you sell alcohol, you're Muslim, you know that this is haram, Allah made it haram. You have two answers here. If he says, of course, haram, of course it's haram. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive me, may Allah guide me. You don't know what I'm going through, you know, life is difficult and inshallah, I really want to make tawbah. Or he says, you know, I know it's haram, I know it's haram, it's okay, I know it's haram, just like... Okay, you, you know, Allah did not send you to open my heart. Some, some, that's not the right answer, by the way. But still, he says, I know it's haram. It's the wrong thing. I know. That's a Muslim. That's a Muslim. That's a Muslim who has disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fasiqun asi, we say, disobedient Muslim. But he's still a Muslim. The Khawarij will say he was a kafir. That's, that's, that's where the Khawarij, they get it wrong. They go to these type of people, someone who committed any sin, they say, you are you are kafir so the khawarij they, for them there's no chance in islam either you are perfect ideal completely 100% 100% obedient of allah or you are kafir that's not what we believe that's not the aqeed of ahlus sunnah now ahlus sunnah when we're talking about legislation here if i give you another example if i tell the same the same muslim who is selling alcohol and he says, no, alcohol is not is not is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with alcohol. And you say, no, but Allah he made haram. Like, yeah, that was back in the days. Time, time, you know, life evolves and we have to change with the time, right? So the laws have changed nowadays and it's okay. It's none of your business, right? It's none of your business. I know what to do. I know I know what's best for me. I know what's best for this life. And uh, some some Arab governments actually, for instance, they produce alcohol and they export it. They export it to other countries. And when they are reminded that alcohol is haram, you say that you are Muslim country. You are you're, you're saying that your religion is Islam. They don't say, you know, astaghfirullah. This is really wrong what we are doing. You know, our governor is not doing the right thing. They will say, no, no, no. We know what we are doing. You know, mind your own business. If you want Islam, go back to the masjid, go do your prayers. They say this is good for our economy. This is for the economy of the country. This is creating uh, basically uh, employment. This is uh, bringing dollars into the country. Um, so this is what, and they make it halal. They make it legal. They change the law to make it legal for at least some people to sell to produce alcohol it's legal you cannot even do in karun munkar if you go to someone in many of the arab countries if you go to someone who does some things that are clearly haram in islam the police the government is going to come after you meaning not only they legislate the batil ahkam that go against the hukum of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they enforce the batil they enforce the wrong thing and they defend the the they defend the wrong thing they defend the haram they defend falsehood and even worse they fight against the haq, the truth, many things that are part of the truth. I will give you a few examples, inshallah ta'ala, in a moment. They go against it. They will use the force. They will punish you for doing the truth, right? So, 
that's not what Islam is about. And this should be obvious to any Muslim, subhanAllah. Also, Brother Sajid, he makes another pretty much uh, pretty big mistake when he says, it is clear that the verses revealed during the 13 years did not focus on legislation. That only came in the Medina period. So now, Brother Sajid is talking about the different phases the, or the two main phases of uh, seer of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he received the message at the age of, age of 40 and um, he lived in Mecca for 13 years. And then he made the Hijrah and he lived in Medina for about 10 years. The pre-13 years or the pre-Hijrah, the 13 years, we call it the Mecca period. The second period we call the Madani period. Now, Brother Sajid, he claims that the ayat to Quran revealed in the first 13 years in Mecca did not focus on legislation. That legislation only came in the Medina period. That's incorrect. So he's trying to say basically that... Um, that the, he, he was saying, I, I don't remember his words exactly, but the, the message he was trying to convey was that in Mecca, it was just about the Akhirah, the year after. It was just about the importance of worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal and having proper intentions and so on and so forth. And then it's only in Medina that Islam started talking about legislation. That's false. Because the ayat in Mecca, it's true that the ayat in Mecca, they focused a lot on the foundations of Islam. More than the details, the practical side of Islam. That is true. In Mecca, it focused a lot on Tawheed. Of, uh, in the Akhirah, for example. But Tawheed, which included the Hukm. Hukm, legislation, even in Mecca, the idea, the concept, not the details of the legislation, the general idea that Islam is about legislation and is also about politics, well, it was mentioned in Mecca. For example, here, Surah Yusuf, so chapter 12, ayah 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In il hukmu illa lillah, amara alla ta'budu illa iyyah. So Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Yusuf, which is a Makki surah revealed before the Hijrah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Al hukm, hukm includes, I explained to you before, includes legislation and politics, laws. Hukm is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amara, he orders that we only make ibadah to him amara alla ta'budu illa iya that ibadah should only be exclusive to Allah so you see here the link between what hukm and ibadah hukm is exclusive to Allah because ibadah is exclusive to Allah hukm is part of the ibadah now Imam Sa'di rahimahullah I always try to quote ulama of tafsir so that you don't think that I'm making my own interpretation of the Quran Imam Sa'di rahimahullah and I strongly encourage you to read tafsir Sa'di those who understand Arabic great tafsir very easy to read full of knowledge very beneficial knowledge for our aqidah and akhlaq and so on and so forth and even to my knowledge it has been translated into english tafsir saadi so that's s a a d i who is saadi by the way saadi just like we spoke before about sheikh muhammad ibn ibrahim being the teacher of sheikh abdullah ibn baz well sheikh saadi ibn saadi he is the main teacher of sheikh ibn uthaymin rahimahumallah ta'ala so people nowadays again the youth they know sheikh ibn uthaymin say sheikh ibn uthaymin he said they say oh okay mashallah that must be the truth because we trust sheikh ibn uthaymin if you trust him you should trust his teacher his main teacher so sheikh ibn uthaymin is only a product of sheikh uh, Ibn Sa'di alayhi wa rahmatullahi ta'ala. So he says, Sheikh Sa'di, in his tafsir of this ayah in Surah Yusuf, لِأَنَّ الْحُكْمَ لِلَّهِ وَحْدَهِ because hukm is exclusive to Allah. فَهُوَ الَّذِي يَأْمُرُ وَيَنْهَى He is the one that gives orders and he is the one that gives warnings. Meaning, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. It's exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيُشَرِّعُ الشَّرَاءَ الشَّرَائِعَ And it is only him that makes the or decides what the legislation is. Is you sharia 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 is sharia legislation. There's no other way to explain this. Wayasunu al ahkam, and he is the one who decides what the ahkam establishes. The ahkam, the rulings. Another ayah in Surah Ashura, so that's Surah 42, ayah number 21. Surah Shura is Makkiya, was revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the Hijrah, Akhi Al-Habib. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, أَمْ لَهُمْ شُرَكَاءُ شَارَعُوا لَهُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا لَمْ يَأْذَنْ بِهِ اللَّهِ Do they have partners? 
Shuraka, they are these mushrikeen. Do they have partners along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And those partners, shara'u lahum. They made legislation to them. Ma lam ya'dham bihillah. So the ayah, it's obvious it's about legislation. Tashriya. Now, Imam Ibn Kathir in his tafsir, he said about this ayah, أي هم لا يتبعون ما شرع الله لك من الدين القويم بل يتبعون ما شرع لهم شياطينهم من الجن والإنس من تحريم ما حرموا عليهم إلى آخر ما قال. So he says these مشركين they don't follow the شرع the legislation of Allah that can be found in this great religion دين القويم بل يتبعون instead they follow the legislation that was made to them by their شياطين he says of الجن and Al-Ins. So we have Shayateen of the Jinn, but we also have Shayateen of Ins, human beings. And these Shayateen, they make legislation that goes against the legislation of Allah. And he mentions, for example, listen to this please, brother. Min tahrimi ma haramu alayhim. Because in the legislation of the Shayateen, they made haram for them things that Allah Azza wa did not make haram. And I will give you a very clear example here. Many of the Arab countries and the countries that we, they call themselves Muslim countries and Muslim states and stuff like that, things are polygamy, things like polygamy, and there's other examples. But let's just give a very clear example here. Polygamy is haram, it's prohibited, it's illegal. They call themselves Muslim country and polygamy is illegal. So if they catch you with having a second wife, they call themselves Muslims, okay? That's the problem. Not like a non-Muslim country, they say we are secular liberal. Okay, it's clear. These people, they call, they claim to be Muslims. Like Allah Azza wa Jalla says, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ يَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكْ يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَتَحَاكَمُوا إِلَى الطَّاغُوتِ وَقَدْ أُمِرُوا أَنْ يَكْفُرُوا بِهِ So they claim to be, يَزْعُمُونَ They claim to be Muslim, they came, claim to be believers, but they make, for example, polygamy illegal. You get punished for it, you go to jail. If they catch you with a woman and you say, this is my second wife, you go to jail. But if you say she's my she's my girlfriend, you're okay and you're defended by the government. They call themselves what Muslim countries. And the problem is, with the time, right, because these legislations that were made a few decades ago, with the time, people, they become so accustomed to them that even inside within these societies, a lot of people, they believe it's actually, yeah, yeah, it should not be done. They say, why? Because it's illegal. It's Ill They say it's illegal. So it's basically legal and illegal this has become the absolute reference not the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you go make salat you make salat taraweeh you go do hajj you go do umrah but at the same time you, you, you have another legislation that decides for the society what is good and what is wrong and you completely reject the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's not what Islam is about it doesn't matter even if you do qiyamul layl every night it's not changing anything kufr is kufr it is kufr akbar also in Surah al jathiyah that's chapter 45, ayah 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةِ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ This is in Mecca, revealed in Mecca before the Hijrah, it's Surah al jathiyah Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the Sharia and Allah tells Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to follow the Sharia that he has revealed on him and not to follow the ahwa, the passions of those who have no knowledge, the ignorant people that just make up their own principles and ideals and laws in this life. If you don't trust my interpretation in Tafsir al-Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, great Tafsir, he quotes Qatar. So Qatada was one of the top scholars of tafsir from the Tabi'een. He learned the tafsir of the Quran from the Sahaba. He says about this ayah, he says Sharia in this ayah, Al Fara'id Wal Hudud Wal Amr Wal Nahyu Fatabiha. He says Sharia is Fara'id, the obligations. Sharia is not just Salat, it's the obligations and Hudud, the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inheritance is the limit. You know, in Tunisia, they claim to be a Muslim government. I'm not talking about the society here. I'm talking about the state. That's what we are talking about. I'm not talking about people outside in the street. The state will claim to be, we are Muslims. We know Islam better than you, right? They abolished the ahkam of inheritance that can be found in the Quran that Allah Azza wa Jal calls very clearly, تِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ These are the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They abolished them. 
right? Some other countries, they kept things from the Sharia for especially like things related to the to uh, to family law and everything because they're just like scared of just coming and shaking right the traditions of the of the of the land itself but some other countries like Tunisia they completely took away the uh, the ahkam of inheritance they made their own ahkam of inheritance so he says sharia is fara'id hudud it is amr wa nahi do and don't do obligation and prohibited so i hope this is clear inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you say there's no legislation really in mecca that's not correct akhil habib yes the details of legislation we call it furu'u sharia tafasilu sharia the details of you know more practices and everything that was revealed in medina very simply because before the hijrah there was a very small number of muslims islam was just starting prophet muhammad awesome did not have a lot of resources with him so it was completely impractical to ask the muslims to practice what we practice today they were being prosecuted that they were like a small group they were not like you know millions of, of hundreds of millions of muslims around the world as it is the case today so today nobody can say all the muslims are being prosecuted and all of them they are mustadafin and all of them have to hide behind trees to pray it's not true it's really not true muslims alhamdulillah they have they have lands and they have resources and they have money and they have knowledge and they have lots of things right they have relationships they are everywhere so you cannot say that muslims they are weak like the beginning of islam that's just not true by the way my brother also you misquoted the hadith of aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha or should i say you misinterpreted you misunderstood the hadith of aisha because you quoted it as an evidence that uh, basically she said that you know in mecca there was not much happening except like tawheed and the akhirah the hereafter uh, but that's not the message that's not what aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha she meant because if you want me to give you a very clear example, you might think this is a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. Aisha radiallahu anha seems to be saying that uh, in Mecca there was zina, there was no, don't commit zina, no prohibition of zina. Well, it's not true, actually, historically. The Quran is very clear on it. So, Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Furqan, Ayah 68. So, this is Surah Al-Furqan, it's Makiya. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرًا وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَمَ إِلَى آخِرِ الْآيَاتِ Very known ayat. Uh, in which Allah Azza wa describes Ibadur Rahman. So the servants of the All Merciful of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Al Rahman, wa Ibadur Rahman, the Ladina Yamshuna Al Ardi Hauna. So in Ayah 68, Allah Azza wa says that part of their traits, their characteristics, Ibadur Rahman, they don't, uh, they don't invoke other, uh, other idols, other partners along with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They don't kill uh, people who are innocent according to Islam. And they don't commit zina. So Allah made it very clear in Surah Al-Furqan that Muslims and believers should not commit zina. So zina, yes, Quran, even in Mecca before the Hijrah was talking about zina. And it was very obvious here in the ayah that it was haram because right after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the punishment for anyone who commits one of these things that were mentioned in the ayah 68, including uh, zina. So Allah azza wa jal says, يُضَعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَبُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانَ And Allah azza wa jal talks about tawbah and so on and so forth. Also in Surah Al-Isra, Surah Al-Isra, also Mecca revealed before the hijrah. Ayah number 32, Allah azza wa jal says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Do not come close to zina so this was in mecca allah azza wa jal yes so there was legislation in mecca so what what did aisha radiallahu anha mean either she's talking here about the very beginning of the mecca period very beginning of the mecca period not all of the mecca period or aisha radiallahu anha she is saying basically that this was not there was not a lot of emphasis on it okay so Allah Azza wa Jal, yes, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling the Sahaba that some things are wrong, like zina and everything, but there was not so much emphasis on them. There was no hudud, no, you know, no, no punishment, no follow-up. So, because again, 
it was left to these first believers and left to their faith and everything once their faith so you can you can benefit from this on an individual level of da'wah individual level so if you know someone who's that we call as we call them non-practicing muslims and you know someone like that and they don't know about the akhirah they don't know much about tawheed and everything and they do a lot of things that are haram that's an individual case. You have to be smart and wise, of course, in your da'wah. Don't go to them and say, you're smoking cigarette, it's haram. You're wearing you know, golden necklace and you're a man, this is haram in Islam. No, he doesn't pray, he doesn't know, even know the foundations of his deen, right? So it doesn't make it halal for him, but it's just that we have more important things to talk to him about, right? So we're going to prioritize. But I'm, I'm afraid of one thing, my dear brother Sajid. I'm afraid that some people who will hear that segment in which you quoted this hadith, they will come out with the very dangerous conclusion, which is known uh, by uh, you know the scholars, some of the scholars, the modern scholars, because there are actually some Islamic groups, some Dawa groups that have adopted this theory, which is a very dangerous one. We call the bid'ah of marhaliyatul ahkam. What is marhaliyatul ahkam? This is a bid'ah, right? Nobody ever said this, but nowadays, because Muslims they are politically weak and oppressed, politically, I'm saying. Um, so some groups they thought they were doing the right thing. They came up with this bid'ah. They said, "Let's just do what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. We're going to go through the Mecca period for a few, for some time, and then once we become strong, we're going to go for the Madani period." Okay, so that's completely incorrect, and that's very dangerous because Islam is complete. Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum. Islam that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi left when he left this world, the one that he left us with, that's the stable Islam that remains until the Day of Judgment. We don't go back in time and say, now we are going to go back to Mecca. That was the very beginning of Islam. There was no other option, no other Muslim community except those very few people that were in in Mecca with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi like Bilal and uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and everything. Nowadays we have tons of communities around the world and all through history, even if Muslims are oppressed in a place in one area of the world, you will see that they are stronger in a different area and so on and so forth. So we cannot do marhaliyatul ahkam because I, I kind of understood that from your words. Maybe that's not what you meant, Akhil Habib, but I kind of understood that, you know, uh, forget forget uh, al-khilafa and sharia and and legislation, everything else. Let's just focus on akhira and tawheed until people they are ready. Well, people, you know, this is this is the bid'ah again, another bid'ah of some du'at, unfortunately, even some scholars, unfortunately, but now it's very obviously very wrong. They said that what the ummah needs is just like focus on tasfiyah and tarbiyah, just on spiritual things for some time until it's ready, right? And this this was started decades ago, and the situation of the ummah. Uh, on a political level has just become worse and worse and worse and more humiliation, right? More humiliation. So you can't just like be talking to people about Tawheed and the hereafter only. I'm saying only. Of course, Tawheed and the hereafter, these are the most important components of our deen. No doubt. But you can't reduce Islam to its foundations and you put aside the other portions of Islam, practical portions and legislation and so on and so forth. And then you say, uh, let's just wait for, for, for some time. First of all, that's a bid'ah. Nobody gave us the right to do this, to pick and choose what we do from Islam. Pick, uh, you know. And number two, it's just never going to happen because, again, the, the one that owns the power, the governor, the one who owns the media, own, legislation is more powerful than any da'wah words you can say, right? You can talk pe to people as much as you want about the akhirah and everything, but most people, they will say, beautiful what you're telling me, but you know, what they're imposing on me outside in the street is quite different, so I have no choice. I have to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what they think, of course. We have no excuse of disobeying Allah azza wa jal. Also, Akhil Habib, yani, just, I'm, I'm asking you a question here, and I know your answer is no, obviously, but I just want to point to how dangerous kind of your conclusion and the way you presented things were. Are you actually telling people that based on the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha and how you have stated that this is kind of our situation today, are you actually telling people that 
Zina and alcohol, Khamar, they're okay for now. Like for now, as long as, you know, Muslims are not, you know, they, they didn't go to the next level of Iman that it's okay that we should accept. Well, because that's what Zina, that's what Hadith Aisha is about. So Aisha, she said, there was no, uh, basically, Zina and Khamar were not really the focus of the message before the Hijrah. So based on this Hadith here in Bukhari, you're saying then, well, Khilafah also and legislation should not be our focus today based on this hadith that if you think so then also let's just apply the hadith let's just apply the examples first mentioned very clear in the hadith and we're going to tell people that it's okay zina and khamr it's okay it's fine for now because you know no it just and also my brother my dear brother um before we move to the final and last uh, last part inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know please don't use these cheap tactics because you used again i'm not here to defend the ideology of the other brother but when you say something wrong to the other brother we have to stand up for the truth akhi. we should not use cheap tactics because you told him do you understand the seerah better or uh, do you understand the seerah better than Aisha radiallahu anha? Mm, that's not a very nice statement, Akhi. That's to be very honest with you. That was quite disrespectful and quite not quite dishonest toward the other brother because the other brother did not say that's what Aisha she said, but I disagree with her. Then of course you have to tell him, Taqillah, fear Allah. Who are you to? Uh, are you are like a scholar, like a top scholar, to disagree with Aisha radiallahu taala anha? That's not what he said. Uh, the brother was saying something, and then you you quoted the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha in return. In your response, you made your own conclusions from the hadith of Aisha, and then you're telling him that you don't know better than Aisha. No, uh, it's between you. It's between the brother's words and between your own understanding of what Aisha she said about the seer of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then also, Akhi, you say, how can someone misrepresent the twenty-three years of Prophet's life sallallahu alaihi wasallam and say it was all about legislation and political power? So you kind of, you know, misrepresenting again what the brother seems to say. I don't think the brother was saying that life of Prophet Muhammad Sassim was only about legislation and political power. I don't think so. If he said so, then obviously he's a jahil, he's ignorant if someone says, says this. However, to a certain extent, yes, legislation and political power were some of the most... Some of, for some of the most important aspects of the seer of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but it it again it seems as if you are you know like it it is as if you know legislation and political powers like this dirty thing this disgusting thing that we should not link to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that's exactly what secularism is about secular Islam secular Islam a lot of the secular uh, rulers in the Arab world that's their trick that's their shaitani trick. Shaitan taught them this, right? They say, Islam is clean, politics are dirty. So let's just not put them together. We do politics. That's what they say. They say, we do politics. It's kind of, they're saying we're dirty. We're disgusting because they know they are disgusting. They say, we do politics. Islam is clean. Just keep it out of this, right? This is exactly what secularism is all about. And secularism, as we all know, it's kufrun mubinun. There's no doubt about this. Because yes, the 23 years of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam were to a certain extent about legislation and political power under the banner of tawhid and divine guidance divine guidance not for material or dunya purposes because here the word politics is problematic why is it problematic because nowadays again politics when you say politics people they associate it with disgusting stuff dirty people don't like politicians they don't they don't have a good image of politicians why why because a lot of them are tricky people they're liars they're they do they manipulate the masses they are there for their own personal causes right their own personal benefit they just want to become famous they would just want to have good relationships they want to leave a future for their children after them for their families 
and so on and so forth. So people, they say, why are these people using us? Like, imagine this is, yes, it is very disgusting for someone to want to become the president or the king or the prime minister just for personal reasons. Basically, you're using everybody else, using the whole society and the land that Allah Azawajal has created, the whole country, you're using it for your own passions, for your own personal interest. How dirty, how disgusting, how evil is that? However, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not doing politics. There's a big difference between someone who does politics for his personal reasons and someone who does politics to guide people. Because what is politics? Politics, political power, is the ability to tell people, go this way and don't go that way. And most people will actually obey you and listen to you because you are in power. That's how it works, right? So outside in the street, when people they obey the rules and the, you know, the, the traffic rules and so on and so forth, for most people, they don't obey the rules because they are good citizens as they claim to be. They just obey the rules because there's law enforcement. There's, there's someone enforcing the laws out there. They're not just giving recommendations. So yes, owning political power does make a big difference in implementing the principles, the values that you are promoting, that you are inviting to. And that's why, by the way, prophets were sent to be political leaders also. Because Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us in the Quran al karim Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 64, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Every Rasul, every messenger that was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was for the purpose of him being obeyed by the people. Prophets did not come with recommendations. You know, like we have, you can go on Amazon and you can find books of self-help where some people, they will say, this is my experience in life. I got for you the seven uh, best habits of, I don't know what, and the other one says, I have 20 uh, ways for you. I have 30 tricks for you. You buy the book, you read it, and you, these are recommendations. You bought the book. You want to implement them. They're telling you you will be more happy if you if you put them in practice. But they're just recommendations. They have no, no sultan on you. They have no force on you. Now, prophets, they were not sent, and messengers, they were not sent just to walk outside in the street and say, these, this is what I really encourage you to do. No, they were sent to be obeyed. The concept of obedience. When you claim obedience, you are claiming authority. And authority is a political concept, Habibi, Akhil Habib. Even inside the house, right? The father, the husband, and the parents, both of them, when it comes to their children, they have authority over. So that's kind of a political system inside, in, even inside your house, right? You establish, you make the rules and you, uh, you blame someone and you, uh, sometimes you judge. You have, let's say you have many children and two of them, they have a disagreement or fighting each other. You have to stand up for the truth. You say, you're right, you're wrong. You listen to both of them. This is politics. Now at a bigger level, society, political level is the one on top, the one who owns the power, he owns the resources, uh, or at least he can manage the resources and so on and so forth. And by the way, that's why some scholars, some ulama, they say this was the difference or this is the difference between the concept of Nabi and Rasul. So we say he is Nabi of Allah, he is Rasul of Allah. There are many Nabi, many Anbiya, many Prophets, and a few Rusul came the hadith of Abu Dhar, but some ulama they say it's a, it's a weak hadith that it's over a hundred thousand Nabi and only about three hundred and fifteen Rasul. Okay, but the idea itself is that we have few Rasul and many prophets. Every Rasul is a prophet, but not every prophet is a Rasul because Rasul is even a higher level. Now, what is the difference between Nabi and Rasul? One definition, one difference, one theory of the ulama which is pretty convincing. They say, Ar-Rasul man uhiya ilayhi bishar'in. Ar-Rasul is the one who received the new legislation. And he came to invite people to it and to kind of enforce it, to implement the legislation. Like Musa alayhi salam, like Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While they say, An-Nabi did not come with a new legislation. He just 
It only came with a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the order from Allah azza wa to invite people back to the legislation of a messenger that was sent before him. So like Musa alayhi salam was sent and then other prophets, they come and they invite to the sharia of Musa alayhi salam. So yes, legislation is, comes hand in hand with the concept of risala, of messengers. And this is one of the pillars of our Islam. Now, Prophets were doing politics, Akhil Habib, but they were doing politics the divine way, not the dunya way, not the disgusting way. Doing politics the right way, divine way. Listen to this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, highly authentic hadith of Abu Huraira. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Kanat Banu Israel tasusuhumu al-anbiya. Banu Israel, they were under the siyasa, tasusuhum. Siyasa, everyone today, anyone who knows a bit of Arabic knows that siyasa is translated as politics, okay? So it's a, if, if it's not the same thing, it's a very close thing. Even today, this is called siyasa, but we have what we have, siyasa tul wadaiya, we have man-made siyasa, politics, the dirty ones, the evil ones. And then we have siyasa that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, siyasa of the prophets. So Banu Israel, the political leaders, tasusuhum, they were anbiya, they were all prophets. كُلَّمَا هَلَكَ نَبِيٌّ خَالَفَهُ نَبِيٌّ Every time a nabi, a prophet would die, pass away, he was their political leader. خَالَفَهُ نَبِيٌّ Another nabi would come to replace him, to be his successor. Because listen to the word here, it says خَالَفَهُ That's where Khalifa comes from. Khalifa, he's the successor. Abu Bakr was the first Khalifa. He was successor of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by the way here, before I continue with the hadith, just to give you an idea about the importance of politics and legislation in Islam, you know that in the hadith of, hadith of uh, Saqifah to Bani Sa'idah, when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu passed away, when he left this world, can you imagine that the Sahaba, before even putting the Prophet sallallahu in his grave, before even doing the defen of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu before that, you know, right after he died, the same night, the Sahaba, they met, to elect their political leader, who should be the Khalifa, successor of Prophet Muhammad Now some people who don't have knowledge, they don't have ilm, this is like problematic to them. A lot of people, they ask this question, they say, how dare the Sahaba not even like, you know, put the Prophet in his grave and they are already, they're talking about politics. Well, because they know that Prophet Muhammad he told them that he explained to them and he taught them how important political leadership is at the core of this religion. That if you don't have a political Khalifa tonight, before even you do the death of Prophet Muhammad guess what's gonna happen? Already they are going to put the Prophet in his grave and they might disagree on some things and they might start fighting because who's gonna, who's gonna say what to do in the end? So no, they wanna make it very clear. Who will be the Khalifa of Rasulullah Sallallahu Khalifa means the successor, the one who replaces Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he says, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, Kullama halaka nabiyun khalafahu nabi. That's for Banu Israel. And then he goes on to say, Wa innahu la nabiyya ba'di wa sayakunu ba'di khulafa'u fayakthuruna. And he says, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, and there is no prophet after me. Now Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's the last prophet. We're not like Banu Israel. So who will be? The leader after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he says, and after me, there will be khulafa, many khalifas, and there will be a lot of them, fayakthuruna. They are the successors of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Now, you also bring the, uh, you know, you, all, you also bring this shubha where you kind of blame the other brother and his tahrir to your understanding and the khawarij and stuff. You say they wanted Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to appear as a politician who wanted sovereignty. So like, again, you're presenting this negatively, like this is wrong. Yes, of course, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu wanted sovereignty. Of course he wanted it, because not for his personal sake, because Allah Azza gave him the responsibility to do so, right? Uh, Prophet Yusuf Alayhi Salam, we know the story of Prophet Yusuf Alayhi Salam, he wanted sovereignty. He said, Ij'alni ala khaza'ini al-ardi inni hafidun alim. He knows, I'm Prophet of Allah, I deserve this. Put me in that position. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu because he was a Rasul, unlike Yusuf Alayhi Salam, not only Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he wanted sovereignty, he actually took it. 
He took it by force, alayhi salatu wa salam, and the Sahaba, they gave it to him, they gave him the bay'ah, and then he went and he took it by force. What is Fathu Mecca? Why did Prophet Sallallahu do conquest of Mecca? That was for sovereignty, right? That was for taking over the land. He did not go with people to Mecca and say, I'm here again, listen to my da'wah, and you cannot harm me because I have my own army now. Well, no, he actually took Mecca and he took many other lands. That was sovereignty, being the sovereign over the land. Why? Because he is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who in his life is more deserving of being the leader of the Muslims except him alayhi salatu wasalam and Allah Azza wa Jal sent him to be obeyed alayhi salatu wasalam. So political, uh, po basically political power and sovereignty is nothing like dirty or disgusting or negative as uh, many of these brothers they make it seem. No, only it's wrong if it's done with the wrong purpose, if it's done for the dunya or if it's done not following the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, you, you mentioned the story here uh, from the seerah, very famous story, my dear brother, where the mushrikeen, they came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and they offered him power and they offered him money and they said, and Prophet sallallahu refused it. But here you did not present the whole picture of the story, Akhi. We have to understand the story. First of all, they offered him power to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, that's true. But not any power, not absolute power. Nobody had absolute power in their time. They gave him basically limited power they offered him. It's a position. They offered him to be in power of Mecca. Of course, under the condition of keeping their Qurayshi principles and values and rituals and worship and law and everything from the Jahiliyyah. But it's just an executive or a, a symbolic position, as we would call it. Let me give you an example, okay? So let's say tomorrow or in a few years in the US where you live, they will present, uh, they will bring a Muslim and they will say, you're a great Muslim, you're a great conservative person, we trust you, they're very trustworthy, we know you pray five times a day in the mosque, your religion, you're a man of principle, right? So we want to give you the position of the President of the United States. All right, and he accepts the position. And he goes sit in that chair in the Oval Office. Do you think he will be able to make the United States a Muslim country? Is he going to be able to implement, you know, Islam and change the United States and bring it closer to the fitrah and tawheed and everything? We all know the answer. It's no. Why? Very simply because the president of the United States, although it's a great position that everybody, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people, they dream about, and it is understood to be one of the most powerful positions in the world. There's no doubt about it. But still, the uh, the powers are, are are limited. He cannot do whatever he wants. There's the Congress, and there's, uh, uh, you know, other executive powers being distributed, and it's also a federation. So you have the different states that have their own meaning. Being in position doesn't always mean you can do whatever you want. That's the type of position they pro they presented to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it was under the condition that he stops insulting their false, you know, gods and idols and Allah wal Uzza yusafihu abahum. So they just said, you know, let's just stop preaching this religion, and we'll put you in power if that's what you're looking for. Of course, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say no, but if the Quraysh they said, oh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we will put you in power. And we will obey you in everything, including your religion. Obviously, Prophet Sallallahu would have accepted because this is exactly what he did with the people of Medina. When they came to make bay'ah to him, what was the bay'ah about? The people of Medina, Al-Aws, Al-Khazraj, bay'ah of Aqaba. What was it about? It was about this. It was about come to Medina, we give you power, you are our ruler, you are uh, our political leader, and we will defend you, and we will follow your religion. That's exactly what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to do by the order of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now, inshallah Azza wa Jal, I will conclude in a bit. Uh, you you blame the brother because you say he made takfir of the guy making allegiance to Charles. You know, there's that video, where there's the guy making allegiance to Charles. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what is strange about this because of course, by default, when I say by default, it means in theory, of course that allegiance is kufr akbar. And that's according to all sources of Islam, all traditional sources of Islam. 
uh, according, bring you know if we had the ability to bring today anyone from the Salaf or anyone from the traditional scholars of the four madahib, all of them they will say this is kufr akbar that image as you presented it or that small segment of the video of him pleading allegiance right but uh, of course doesn't mean that we're making necessarily individual takfir because I don't even know who that person is. I don't know what the story is. Uh, I don't know if it was just like uh, someone, you know, making drama or acting or if it was true or if he was forced to do so. I don't know. We don't just make takfir of someone just by watching, you know, a segment of the video without really having details. But you, I, 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 I don't think the brother made takfir of him, first of all. So you're kind of exaggerated when you're presenting it that he's making takfir of him right and um he was mentioning that this is you know clear kufra yes it is it is kufra akbar actually there's no doubt about it and the same thing here akhil habib you blame the brother and you say that the hizb tahrir and the khawarij they claim so this i found this to be really strange from you akhi akhi sajid you say that they claim that the rulers of the Muslim world are not 100% implementing Islam. And then you say, according to him. So you kind of, I, so are, are you telling me you disagree with him? You disagree? Uh, are you telling me you believe that the rulers of the, of the Muslim world are implementing 100% Islam? So you're not even saying they're implementing Islam. So you, you, you can't, what I understood from your word here is that you don't even accept if someone says they don't implement Islam 100%. So if, if someone says to you they implement 80% Islam, you will disagree with them? Akhi, they don't even implement 5% of Islam. They have nothing to do with Islam. Uh, were, to be uh, like, please, please forgive me here, but in which world do you live, Akhi? In which world do you live? If you go to the Arab countries, for example, if the walls and the rocks could speak, they will tell you that these rulers, they don't implement Islam and they hate Islam. They are enemies of Islam. And by the way, and again, I'm very sorry here for being a bit like rude towards you, Akhil Habib. But if you believe that these countries in the Muslim world, they are implementing 100% Islam, why are you staying in the United States, Akhi? What? Why are you living there? What are you doing there? As a Muslim, aren't you supposed to be living in a place that implements 100% Islam? Don't you think, Akhi, that's kind of hypocritical? Even like some of the enemies of Islam, right? They they bring that, they bring that, uh, the shubha, they say, well, if you love Islam, just go live in a Muslim, Muslim country, right? For people who really understand their Islam, they know that doesn't make sense because there is no real Muslim country nowadays, at least in the big countries, I'm not going to talk about any small countries that I, I don't know much about, but the, no, let's say the, the known nations, there is no Muslim country. When I say Muslim country, I'm talking about the state. I'm not talking about the society. We have Muslim world. We have the Muslim societies. They are Muslims. People outside in the street, by default, they are Muslims. Okay, and we're not khawarij here. We're not doing takfir of the societies. Please don't misquote me here. But I'm talking about the nations, the states, the governments. Where's Islam? If you found Islam, what are you doing in the United States, Akhi? What are you doing? Uh, why, why do we have millions of Muslims living in the West and around the world? Of course, many of them, they went to the West just for dunya, but not everybody went for dunya. For a lot of people, if they could find Islam, even 50% Islam, they will be back. And don't you think this is kind of, you know, an insult to Islam? I'm very sorry. Don't you think this is like kind of an insult to Islam? You're saying these governments are actually implementing 100% Islam. So if they are implementing 100% Islam, then the consequences of 100% Islam is the chaos and the mess we see. Some of the worst countries in the world when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the social matters and, uh, you know, the, the crimes and the poverty and everything. You're telling me that in Egypt where you have millions of people who live in graveyards, okay, you're telling me they're implementing 100% Islam. 100% Islam. Then you're just giving, you know, uh, you're just actually giving... Um, a proof, a hujja, a fake hujja, of course, a false hujja, to the enemies of Islam who say, well, look what Islam did to your countries. 
No, they're not implementing Islam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people of the book, not even the people of the Quran, Quran which is the best book. Allah Azza wa says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ أَقَامُوا التَّوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلَ وَمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ لَأَكَلُوا مِنْ فَوْقِهِمْ وَمِنْ تَحْتِ أَرْجُلِهِمْ Islam, yes, Islam comes with trials and tests, but Islam does not come with humiliation, does not come with a constant suffering. In the Muslim world, people, most people, they live in constant suffering, Akhi Habib. People in North, in North Africa and Libya and even, I believe, in Egypt, people, we have tons of youth every day, daily. They throw themselves in the ocean. They just take, even if they can find, you know, like a small stick of wood, a piece of wood like this, if they can find it, if they trust it, they go on it, if they believe it's going to take them to Europe, to a different world. And not all of them are doing it because they don't like Islam or they just want to go see haram things in, in Europe or in the West. A lot of them because they just see no hope in those lands. There are no values. The crime rate, right? Even the types of crime that we hear about nowadays in the Arab world, it's like so shameful, right? It's so sh it's like we, f we feel ashamed talking about it because it's kind of, you know, replicating what what is happening in america or in the west it's exactly the same thing now now you have situations where uh, a a man kills his wife and his kids and then you know kills himself you have situations where a guy kills his girlfriend or a girl she kills her boyfriend this is happening in the arab countries which type of 100 percent islam is being implemented akhil habib so also you blame him you know for you say is uh, these people they are going to make takfir of the rulers and everything. Uh, look, I'm I'm very sorry to shock you and to shock many many uh, maybe many of the viewers, but I'm not about you know if people want to want to put bad comments, bad reviews, bad ratings, I really don't care because I'm here to say the truth to teach you the truth. And the truth is what Allah Azza wa is pleased with, not what people are ready to hear. There's things that people, they're not ready to hear and it just triggers them because they're being conditioned. Like words like takfir. Takfir, there's the false takfir and there's the justified takfir. Takfir bil haq, takfir bil batil. So when you do takfir for wrong reasons, very dangerous. But when you make takfir for the right reasons, it's just the practice of Islam. It's part of Islam. Takfiru bihaq. So I'm sorry to shock you, but yes, there are many rulers in the Muslim world who are very clear kafir, kuffar, murtaddin. They are the enemies of Islam, enemies of Allah Azza wa Jal. Assisi is a kafir, Aduullah, he's the enemy of Allah Azza wa Jal. The leader of the UAE, the king or the prince, whatever he, they, they, they call him, he is a kafir, Aduullah, he's the enemy of Islam. I re I'm responsible for this, you know, if I know that I will die in two minutes and I will meet Allah Azza wa Jal with these words, I will say them because I will be more than happy and pleased to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with them because this is what Islam is about. It's about the truth. Now, as I said, these people, they're not just not implementing Islam as you seem to have this question, like, yeah, they are implementing. No, no, they are fighting against Islam. They are enemies of Islam. They hate the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah Azza wa Jal revealed it to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, of course, some of them, they would like to keep uh, another version of Islam, a personalized, they want to make their own Islam. And that's not a valid Islam. Islam cannot be modified by governors or rulers. And you spoke about bloodshed before and everything. And you you know, if you don't know, it's a problem, Akhi. If you do, make a da'wah and you, know, you don't know this type of, this, this kind of historical facts, then there's a problem. But we know that what happened right after the death of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, beginning of Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr, the first of the Salaf, the best of the Salaf, the best of the Salaf are the Sahaba, and the best Sahabi is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. What did Abu Bakr do? Abu Bakr faced one challenge from the very beginning of his Khilafah. He had some people who claimed to be Muslims. They said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They made Salah, they were Musallihin. They made Hajj. They made Ramadan, but they said zakat, we're not giving you our money. We don't pay zakat. There's no such thing as zakat anymore. They said because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu died, we used to give him zakat. We're not going to give zakat to any ruler after him. And you know what 
Abu Bakr Sadiq did to them, right? He did not make da'wah videos on YouTube for, for, uh, for, for them. He did not give them boxes of dates and make meetings with them to try to convince them, please give zakat. You know very well what happened in what is known as the wars of apostasy. So imagine if someone, according to the same way you presented things, my dear brother in Islam, when you're saying that all of this here is just politics, is not really... Well, someone can say to Abu Bakr Sadiq, like Abu Bakr is making the whole deen about charitable work. He just wants to raise money for the poor people. It's okay. It's not a big deal, right? They're making salat. They're making. So what if Abu Bakr Sadiq saw these rulers today who fight against Islam? They hate Islam. They, if you want to practice Islam, they will torture you. They will punish you. And if you want to do things against Islam, in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, they will protect you. Let me give you one social experiment you can try if you want, and then I will uh, end, inshallah, with a quick bonus with uh, two quotes, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the kalam of the ulama. If you're not sure about what I'm saying to you, Akhi Sajid, then I encourage you to try this social experiment, and you can film yourself, and guaranteed, inshallah, the video will go viral. You can go to any Arab country, okay, and take a, uh, I was going to say a black, but Let's just, I'll, I'll make it easy for you. A white flag. Take a white flag and write on it, La ilaha illallah. Kalima of Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. And go out in the street with a big white flag that says, La ilaha illallah. And walk with it in Arab countries, especially in major cities. What is the reaction you will, you will have? The reaction of the people outside in the street, because they are Muslim, they love Islam. Most of them, most of them, they will be happy. They will, even if maybe they're, they will, they will not be very confident to come talk to you directly. But wow, they will say, "MashaAllah." He has like you know, say, "La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah." You will remind them of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Some of them they will say, "La ilaha illallah." But guess what? Pretty fast, guaranteed. Pretty fast, you will be picked up by the government and you will be transformed into kufta, my friend. Why? What did you do wrong? You had the flag of La ilaha illallah. All Muslims should agree on La ilaha illallah, right? Well, you will say, uh, you, yeah, but you know, some people, they misre misrepresented that flag and you know, they, there was crimes and stuff. Okay, no problem. Go to those very same countries. Walk with a rainbow flag. Walk with a rainbow flag. Then, of course, you might face, okay, you might get in trouble with Al-Ahali with the citizens outside in the street. That's a different story with the Muslims outside in the street. But the governments will protect you, especially if they, they know you're a foreigner. Okay, So if you're a foreigner, you're an American, you walk with the flag of La ilaha illallah, it doesn't matter. Being an American is not really going to be in your favor. But if you're an American, you walk with a rainbow flag, trust me, you're, you're protected. You know The government is going to be there to protect you. And this week, you know, the government of Qatar has said very clearly that during the World Cup, people will have the right to raise the flag of, you know, the rainbow flag. The question is, will people be able to, ra to raise the flag of La ilaha illallah also? Uh, also, like, okay, not the rainbow flag. Um, let's, uh, okay, go, go, in North, go in North Africa, the countries of North Africa, and walk outside with the French flag, the flag of the French, Re the French Republic, France. No one is going to touch you. No one is going to touch you. Okay? No one is going to touch you. You can put it on your car and you will tell me about the bloodshed, uh, you know, made, you will say, by the Khawarij under the flag of Tawheed and everything. Well, France, just a, less than a century ago, it killed millions and millions and millions of North Africans. Okay? So they do have a history here of blood. So that, that flag should remind them, at least, you know, from a cultural perspective, that oh, this flag is reminding us of our, our ancestors who died, who were tortured, who suffered so much. But still, they will not touch you. They will respect the flag. But if you have a flag that says, La ilaha illallah, what does that tell you about their Islam, Habibi? Taib. As a bonus, inshallah, akhil Habib, barakallahu feek. As a bonus, to conclude, I'm sorry, uh, this video is a long video, but this is deen. This is Islam. We have to we have to give the evidence. We have to explain. Let me quote you very very briefly here. We have a book from Taysir al-Aziz al-Hamid. So this is a very famous reference on Tawheed. Uh, anyone who 
claims to be a Salafi should have full respect for this book. Uh, so Taysir al-Aziz al-Hamid, Taysir al-Aziz al-Hamid is one of the top uh, commentaries on Kitab al So page 944 from the edition of Daru al-Sumay'i. You can easily find it online, PDF version. So in Kitab al it says, Babu, chapter or section about, Man ata'a al-ulama awal umara afi tahrimi ma ahalla allahu wa tahlili ma harrama allahu faqad ittakhadahum arbaban min dunillah. He says, this is Kitab al he says, this chapter is about explaining how the one who obeys the ulama, the scholars, or the umara, the governors, in making haram what Allah made halal, tahrimi ma ahalla Allah, wa tahlili ma harram Allah, and making halal, making licit what Allah Azza wa Jal has made haram is illicit. Then what is his... Um, what is his uh, title in Islam? What, what is the consequence of that? Well, it says, فَقَدْ اتَّخَذَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Then that person has taken the ulama, the scholars, or the umara, the governors, as lords, arbab, partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's telling you this is shirk even in the rububiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is in Kitab al-Tawheed. Now, Taysir al-Aziz al-Hamid of al shaykh one of the scholars of the past, he goes on to explain why, like he's explaining why. لَمَّا كَانَتْ طاعات من أنواع العبادة بل هي العبادة فإنها طاعة الله بامتثال ما أمر به على ألسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. He says because طاعة obedience so obedience here to authority politics don't have to be super smart to understand this legislation. He says because obedience is one form of ibadah. Remember when you said that ibadah has nothing to do with politics and legislation? No, he's telling you that obedience is part of ibadah. And then he says, no, 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 actually, bel hi al ibadah too. Actually, he says, no, obedience is ibadah. Ibadah is obedience and obedience is ibadah. He says, نبه المصنف رحمه الله بهذه الترجمة he says the musannif meaning the author of kitab al-tawheed he wants to explain then على وجوب اختصاص الخالق تبارك وتعالى وأنه لا يطع أحد اختصاص الخالق تبارك وتعالى بها وأنه لا يطع أحد من الخلق إلا حيث كان طاعته مندرجة تحت طاعة الله he says the author wants to explain to us that Ta'a, the right to ta'a, to obedience, is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that none of the creation should be obeyed unless it falls under the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning it doesn't go against the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he explains further. وَالْمَقْصُودُ هُنَا الطَّاعَةُ الْخَاصَّةُ فِي تَحْرِيمِ الْحَلَالِ أَوْ تَحْلِيلِ الْحَرَامِ He says this chapter is more specifically about the obedience in making haram what is halal. So, like I said, they make polygamy and many other things that are clearly halal in Islam. They make them haram, prohibited, illegal in those Muslim countries. They punish you for them and they enforce it very seriously. في تحريم الحلال أو تحليل الحرام or they make the haram halal. They made riba halal. So, Almost all of the Arab countries, if not all of them, they run on riba. And riba is within the system. It's not like somebody is doing something wrong. No, riba is a natural, it's a normal thing. It's a legal thing. It is promoted. It is defended. If you dare go and, you know, blame them for that, they will punish you severely. So he says, فَمَنْ أَطَاعَ مَخْلُوقًا فِي ذَلِكَ غَيْرَ الرَّسُولِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فإنه لا ينطق عن الهوى فهو مُشْرِكٌ So whoever obeys a person, a human being, a creation of Allah, except Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, so Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, he's an exception because he talks, he just transmits the revelation, he doesn't make up his own things, عليه الصلاة والسلام. He says whoever obeys someone, anyone, except Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, in deciding what is halal and what is haram, then he is a mushrik 
polytheist subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he goes on to mention the famous hadith of Ali, Adi ibn Hatim Adi ibn Hatim he was from the people of the book very briefly the Sahabi so when he accepted Islam he came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam recite the ayah in surah at tawbah ayah number 31 Surah Tawbah, Ayah 31, that says, in which Allah Azza wa Jal says, اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهبانهم أرباب من دون الله. Allah Azza wa Jal says that the people of the book, they took their ahbar and their ruhban, their scholars, they took them as arbab, lords, as partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adi ibn Hatim, what did he say to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here? He says, Ya Rasulullah, inna lisna na'buduhum. Listen, he said, Adi ibn Hatim, he kind of had the same question as you, Brother Sajid, but Adi ibn Hatim, he asked to learn. He did not go directly to blame other people without actually verifying. He said, Ya Prophet of Allah, we did not make ibadah to them. Why is Allah saying that we took our scholars? Because Adi ibn Hatim, he was from the people of the book before. He knows their culture. He's saying, Ya Rasulullah, Allah is saying that we took them as lords, our scholars. We never worshipped them. We never like made sujood to them and everything. He said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He said, isn't it that they give themselves the right to make haram what Allah made halal, and they make halal what Allah made haram, and you obey, you listen to them, you follow them in that? He said, Qultu bala. He said, yeah, of course we did that, unfortunately. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَتِلْكَ عِبَادَتُهُمْ That's ibadah, that's making ibadah to them. You people were doing ibadah to them without even realizing. So the same thing here, without even realizing. And by the way, since I said without even realizing, sometimes that's why we have to learn our deen. I will conclude with the words of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah رحمه الله تعالى. This is from Majmu' al-Fatawa, first volume. He says, فَإِنَّ الْإِشْرَاكَ فِي هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَخْفَى مِنْ دَبِيبِ النَّمْلِ He says, shirk, polytheism, in this ummah, it's hidden, it's very subtle. It's hard to notice sometimes. It's not like the umam of the past, you know, the mushrikeen of the past. You, you can see clearly somebody doing sujood to a stone like this. You say, mushrik, khalas. Praying to a tree, praying to the stars, he's a mushrik. Now, in this ummah, he says, shirk sometimes can be hard to notice. That's why we need to learn our deen. Akhfa min dabib naml He says, sometimes, you know, more hidden than the the basically the the motion of the ants when the ants are, are walking like this you don't really notice them that's how shirk is in this ummah and then he says he mentions three types of shirk three types the the three main types of shirk imam ibn taymi says wa huwa shirk fi al-ibadati wa ta'alluhi wa shirk fi at-ta'ati wa al-inqiyad wa shirk fi al-iman wa al-qabul first he says the shirk of ibadah shirk of ibadah is again like invocation invoking the dead bodies and so on and so forth praying to the stars to the moon shirk of ibadah that's one form and then Number three, he mentions shirk of iman and qabul, shirk of pure belief, information, shirk al-ilmi. So someone says, uh, you know, rain is falling because of that star. And you say, why? He said, because I'm telling you so. Okay, I believe then it's the star that's sending the rain. That's shirk fi al-imani wal qabul. And then number two, which is why I quoted this shirk fi ta'ati wal qiyad the shirk of ta'ah the shirk of obedience so you obey other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when only Allah azza wa jal should be obeyed in the ahkam so he explains what he means by this second form of shirk and then we will conclude insha'Allah wa kathiru min al-mutafaqihati wa ajnadi al-muluki wa atba'i al-qudat wa al-aamati al-muttabi'ati li ha'ulai yushirikuna shirk al-ta'a he says who for example commits the shirk of ta'a of obedience listen this is politics he says it's a lot of mutafaqiha mutafaqiha are the fake sheikhs because the rulers on top the governors they will always need what some sheikh to tell the people ah oh, what our king he did it's the right thing we should listen to him okay so these are mutafaqiha number two ajnadul muluk the soldiers of the kings and the rulers so and number three, atba'i al-qudat, the followers of the court system and the justice system and the, the judges and so on and so forth. wal as well as the mainstream, the masses outside, not the mainstream, the masses. 
the normal people. He says a lot of these people, these categories, those who just follow, they commit shirk al-ta'ah. They commit this shirk of al-ta'ah, shirk of obedience. Why? So this is about politics. He's talking very clearly here about the soldiers. He's talking about the kings and the courts. And this is politics. So politics, yes, has things to do with shirk. He says, He says, you find many of these people who are deviants he called them Munharifin. They make obligation wajib what his boss, what his governor said to be an obligation. And make haram prohibited what his ruler declared to be prohibited. And, and halal legal what his ruler declared to be halal, to be legal. And a deen religion is what his ruler decides about. And then he just wants to make sure that you don't think that this is just about, you know, a zakat and what we do in the masjid. He says, no, imma deenan wa imma dunya. Either in the deen or in the dunya. So all of this is a form of shirk. Whether they play with the deen of the, of the people or with the dunya of the people, they try to tell them this is halal, this is haram, with no basis from the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is shirk of obedience of a ta'a. ثُمَّ يُخَوِّفُ مَنِ امْتَنَعَ مِنْ هَذَا الشِّرْكِ And then to make it even more obvious here why I'm quoting this statement also because it represents the governors we have today in the Muslim world. They scare you, they frighten you that don't you dare disobeying them. It's not like they're doing something and they're encouraging it. No, they enforce it with all their power. They force you to do things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not approve of. My dear brother, I hope inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this information uh, was an eye-opener. Again, I'm not here my aim is not to say that anyone is wrong, anyone is bad, anyone is destroyed. I encourage my brother uh, Sajid Filahi subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue doing da'wah in matters in which he has knowledge. But inshallah azza wa jal, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us accept the truth and submit to it. صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين.